Okay, everybody, so I'm doing another book review. This time the book is Christian Science by Mark Twain. And the first thing I want to mention is the voice of the narrator. I, I really appreciate it. I'll link the version I listened to down in the description. I appreciated the voice because it's pretty much exactly what I imagined Mark Twain sounded like. Just that sort of deep, sort of gruff voice, but still he does, he does a good job conveying the intellectual curiosity while still sounding like a rugged 19th century American. I don't know the name of the narrator, I wish I did. Second thing I want to mention is I actually specifically refrained from looking up whether this book was fiction or non-fiction until after I finished it. So I, I got to the end, I was so eager to start googling things to figure out whether this was real, and uh, boy howdy, lo and behold, yep, it's real. There's the Wikipedia page, there's the picture of Mrs. Eddy, there's the, you can go in and read the bylaws for yourself. Oh man, that was, that just made my entire day when I found out that actually happened, this was actually a real thing. The third thing I want to mention is I started actually keeping a list of my favorite insults that I read from any book ever. There's three of them on there so far. The first one is also Mark Twain. It's from Connecticut Yankee and King Arthur's Court. The second one is from George Orwell, Homage to Catalonia. And the third one is from this book, For all the strange and frantic and incomprehensible, uninterpretable books which the imagination of man has created, surely this one is the prize sample. Hmm. I love his power of description, specifically describing dim-wittedness and mediocrity. The first insult I mentioned, the one from Connecticut Yankee, that ties in as well. The man's head was like an hourglass. He could take an idea, but only one small grain at a time. You need to feed it to him bit by bit. I love Mark Twain. I just, listening to this at work, I was just like cracking up at certain parts because I just love Mark Twain's style. And it's just, it's, it's just fun to see how artfully he can take down ideological opponents. It's like what the New Yorker was meant to be. So now I'm going to get into talking about the actual plot. This one had an absolutely excellent hook. It drew me straight in. So it starts out, Twain is on vacation. He's backpacking through Europe. He's hiking. He falls. He describes that he hits a rock, bounces off, hits another rock, bounces off, hits a third rock, breaks some bones, breaks an arm, breaks a leg, you know. So he's in this alpine mountain home of some old lady from a small alpine village, laying in bed with all these broken bones, and the lady's like, okay, I know who exactly can fix you. I will go fetch her. And it turns out to be another old lady from Boston, and the lady sends a note, oh, sorry, I can't come tonight, but just stay calm and remember there's nothing wrong with you. And this is where the real comedy begins. Twain's like, oh, did you explain to her that I fell from however many feet? Yes. Did you explain to her that I hit a rock on the way down? Yes. And that I have a bunch of broken bones? Yes. And that I hit another rock after I bounced off the first rock? Yes. And she says there's nothing wrong with me? Yes. And then the next morning she arrives, and she starts explaining, No, no, we don't... We, I'm a Christian scientist. We don't look at the body at all. We deal only with the mind. And she goes into this whole spiel, pain isn't real. And then in the middle of this, Twain describes, oh, she swung her hand and she accidentally pricked herself on one of the pins that was in her dress. And she said, ow, right after saying pain isn't real. Pain is only an illusion. And then she steps on a cat's tail and the cat screams out. Just a lot of comedy packed into this scene where he's explaining the meat and bones of what Christian scientists believe about the body being an automaton, pain being an illusion, the mind being the only thing that's real, and then not even the mind, the soul. So above all, it's a faith-healing ideology, but it's also one which denies the realness of the physical world. And I, I could get into how that conflicts with my view of Christianity, but I just don't think this is the video for that. So instead, I'll get into the next part. Mark Twain goes off on this long chapter, going over the pros and cons of this specifically of the way of thinking of the ideology, and he examines the idea that so much of the pain, so much of the sensation we experience is just all in our heads. And he examines the concept of being able to reduce that pain, that displeasure, that uh, the antithesis to felicity, I believe. Felicity is the word that Aristotle, I think it was, used in Nicomachean Ethics. That's the word I default to when talking about this sort of concept. So, reducing the antithesis to felicity. Twain thinks, yeah, well, this way of thinking probably will have a good effect on the world in that way. And something else I wrote down, I know it's not an exact fit for the concept, 
I also know the word placebo effect. I don't think that was invented in Mark Twain's time, but it made me think of the concept of placebo effect the way he described it. And the other conclusion he comes to is he hypothesizes that the happiness in the average Christian science believer will trickle down to them doing better at their job, and that will trickle down to society as a whole being improved. So he concludes all this by saying, will it make the world happier? He believes there's a good chance, yes. And another thing he says, he goes into, on one tangent, talking about people who will inevitably say that other parents shouldn't be allowed to take their kids to a Christian science doctor, they should be made to take their kids to a real doctor. And the response he gives to that is, why shouldn't parents be able to give their kids what they believe is the best treatment. Because I, I do see the same argument in the modern day with a lot of various things. Twain's answer to that would seem to be, is it your kid? No. Is it the state's kid? No. It's the parent's kid. The parents should decide what they think is best for their kid, even if the parents are what we would consider crazy. And that's another important tangent we get into. What is craziness? Well, I'll give a modern-day example for this, illustrating what Twain's opinion on that would be, or at least what his conclusion in this book would be. Is somebody who voted Hillary Clinton in 2016 crazy? Well, someone who voted Trump in 2016 would say so, but then that Clinton voter, in the eyes of the Trump voter, they might be completely competent, adequate individuals in other ways. And flip the tables here, is somebody who voted Trump in 2016 crazy? Well, somebody who voted Clinton in 2016 would say so, but then again, they might be a completely decent human being in other ways. Is a Muslim crazy? Well, only religiously, and only a Christian would say so. Is a Christian crazy? Well, only religiously, and only a Muslim would say so. And on and on, with all these different groups. Is a Christian scientist crazy? Well, if you see a Christian scientist working at their day job and doing a good job like they always do, you wouldn't think that they were crazy. But only if you see what they believe and how they worship, then someone who disagrees with that would probably call it crazy. The meat and bones of the book really is examining the structure of the Church of Christ scientist, I believe is what they call it. So Mark Twain examines the way of thinking itself isn't that bad, but Twain goes deep into examining the organization itself and Mrs. Eddy, who is the founder of Christian Science, he goes deep, deep, deep into examining her, starts by tearing apart the bylaws itself for the organization and, and revealing just how much of a stranglehold of control she has over the church, all the congregations, all its members. A few examples he gives, there are no preachers in the church. People aren't allowed to give sermons, they simply read from both the Bible and from Mrs. Eddy's book. They are allowed to apply for lectures, but the lecturer and the subject of the lecture must be chosen by Mrs. Eddy and the date arranged in advance. She is allowed to excommunicate anyone for any reason, no notice needed. She is allowed to dismiss any reader, not preacher, reader, for any reason, no notice needed. Twain also mentioned that Mrs. Eddy liked to copyright everything. Just want to mention the fun little difference between copyright law then and now just from the few tidbits here and there of the specifics that Twain mentioned in the book. Uh, standard copyright was 42 years at that time. Copyright law now is absolutely a mess of confusion, but uh, there's one rule of thumb for books at least 100 years is the rule of thumb. I've also heard author's life plus 70 years for many things. It's confusing enough that there is a legitimate legal defense if you run afoul of copyright law, that you had no reason to believe the thing you were using the violated copyright was under copyright. That's how confusing it is. Copyright law is an absolute hydra of confusion, and none of it's needed. Let's just go back to the 40-year system. Thank you, Disney. Twain also mentioned that there's only one book ever, at least in the UK, that has a perpetual copyright, at least at the time of Twain's writing. That book with a perpetual copyright is blah 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 drumroll the Bible. That's just really funny to me. Twain also goes into all the ways that Mrs. Eddy makes money. Uh, one of the things she he talks about is her book, which all Christian scientists are required to keep. And he goes into the numbers of the, the number of congregations, the number of churchgoers, estimating the demand for that book and what that yearly printing contract to the print house would look like. As a published author himself, he says, in his expert opinion. Yeah, printing costs for that book would be really cheap because it's something the print house can just work on anytime they have idle time because they know there's always going to be demand. Mrs. Eddy also had a college 
and this college had, I forget the exact number, some hundreds of dollars of tuition. And Twain goes into, like, counting all the students, the annual tuition costs. He goes into this and that, calculating the college's income, and by extension, Mrs. Eddy's income. He goes into all those previous points in much more depth than I'm going into now. There's also the question of plagiarism. He firmly believes that Mrs. Eddy did not write or at least did not come up with the original idea that she illustrated in her book about Christian science. He gives evidence for this in her writing style, which he says is absolutely distinguishable from anything else, and in the originality of the idea. Twain claims that the original author, or rather the person who originally came up with the idea, is likely long dead, and Mrs. Eddy just took the work from a long-dead person and presented it as her own work. And when you think about it, she could have easily presented it as the long-dead person's work, but then said, hey, this is real, I'm going to spread this faith, this is what I believe and you should believe it too, it just comes from this other person and not from me. Now the reason for that, Twain says, he actually compares Mrs. Eddy's love for self-deification to Mark Twain's love for pie. He claims she has a big head, a big ego, all the all the power of being in control of this large organization got to her head and corrupted the original purity of the intentions behind this church. He says that self-deification in Mrs. Eddy's case is simply the spiritual equivalent for Mark Twain's physical love of eating pie. And one of the examples he gives, there's a building in Boston, and Mark Twain claimed to have visited there previously, and he saw behind glass a portrait of Mrs. Eddy that people would worship. And then, of course, the writing spans over the course of a few years. At one point, the portrait was taken down, and Christian scientists were complaining to Twain, hey, this portrait's not here, what are you writing about? And then Twain corrects himself in a later year, well, these people have told me the portrait's not here, I will amend my statement. Yes, that's correct, the portrait was taken down. What's currently there is a picture of the chair that Mrs. Eddy sat in when she wrote her book, and people worship that the same way. And indeed, very early on in the book, even as early as when he's back in the Alps laying on that bed, he predicts that Mrs. Eddy will come to be known as a Mother Mary figure, capital M, Mary. I believe her first name happens to be Mary, anyway. And he bases that on the old lady from Boston who was healing him. In her explanation of Christian science, somewhere along the way, she gives him a quote from the Book of Revelation about a woman coming with a book in her hand, and she claims that the woman is Mrs. Eddy, and the book is the, the Book of Christian Science. There is sort of... Of, I'll call it a tangent, and I don't think it fits in well with the rest of the book, but Twain goes into a whole thing writing about actual Christianity, writing about the pitfall of biblical hypocrisy, which is praying, but then continuing to sin, but then thinking that the prayer is salvation, that because you're praying, it's a way out, it's instant forgiveness without actually feeling remorse for the sin that you're continuing to do. And he concludes that people require prayer with combined with the fervent desire to know and do the will of God. Now, getting into the psychology of Mrs. Eddy, at least from Twain's perspective, uh, Twain writes that a person's nature never changes. That is a common theme in this book. So if a person is ambitious, like Mrs. Eddy is, it could be dormant, it could remain in the body. He compares it to an organ that can be found on autopsy, but you never know it's there until you find it. He says if Mrs. Eddy had never written that book, she might never have had the opportunity to stretch her muscles of control over an organization and a stranglehold over the bylaws and everything like that. And Twain believes that Mrs. Eddy started out with absolutely pure intentions and she remained unaware of her ambitious nature, person's nature never changes, and then when she saw the opportunity to take control, she pounced on it. I myself will go off on a tangent here and talk about my experience with the Hare Krishna cult. So I was in college and I was going through a comparative religion class and as a class requirement, the entire class was required to make a field trip to a Buddhist temple, a Muslim temple, a Jewish synagogue, and then, of course, a Hindu temple. Oh, and I also visited a Catholic church, but I, I grew up Catholic, so that wasn't a significant experience for me. The Hindu temple is what struck me, what stayed with me, because for this particular one, I don't believe for the others, but for this particular one, they scheduled the entire class to go at once, and for whatever reason, there was a schedule conflict for me, 
So what I did instead is I visited that temple the next day. So all on my lonesome, I made a visit to the Philadelphia Hare Krishna Temple. And I spent, I think it must have been like a whole half a day there. So I, getting the impression of the place, I looking at their holy books. We spent a significant amount of time actually just chanting their words, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Hare Rama, Hare Rama. And they explained how they would go out in public, like go out to sports events and stuff like that and chant these words. And the bystanders around would make fun of them like, oh, Coca-Cola, pretend to be chanting about Coca-Cola or hamburgers or something like that. But through their faith, they remain strong. They keep chanting. They don't get distracted. At the time, I was much less acquainted with having a relationship with God. But looking back on it now, chanting that just felt like words to me. It's not a conversation with the above. It's just, it's meditation and it's very limited meditation. It's not focusing, it's not mindfulness meditation where you're focusing on the world around you. It's meditation where you're focusing only on those words, only on those phrases, the things that are coming out of your mouth. Uh, something else they showed me was, of course, their scriptures, which were the Bhagavad Gita and the Ramayana, but not the real Bhagavad Gita or the real Ramayana. No, 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 no. The version that was annotated by their founder in the 1970s, heavily annotated. It's a mess. I would say annotated to the point where it is no longer the original text. And then for lunch, we went upstairs to the dining hall. We had a vegan lunch, which actually I remember that tasted okay, but sitting down, I was talking to people and they were telling me about how, oh yeah, I, we all our family told us we were making a bad idea, but no, we just wanted to be here so badly. We sold our homes, we sold our cars, we sold all our possessions, we gave all the money to the temple, and now we live here. And that just struck me as deeply, deeply wrong. Like, your family wants you back. You're not living life to its fullest. You're not facing challenges and meeting them. No, you're giving up and giving all your autonomy to a temple. That's not what it means to be human. Of course, I didn't say that to him at the time. But then, of course, I, I went home and looked up more on the internet later. It turns out that uh, that monk or whatever from the 1970s was... I forget if he was only a pervert or if he was also a child molester. I honestly forget. But there was some sexual scandal with him. I, I looked up like, blog posts from people who claim to have gotten out of the Hare Krishna temple. They claimed that, like, sex was only for reproduction, and there was, like, this whole ritual around sex. Like, you're supposed to chant the words the entire time you're having sex, so you're focusing on the words and not the sex. It's just so weird. It's just such a weird group. Like, people giving up their lives, so... for what? So they can walk around the streets of big cities and beg for donations. Like, if you see someone on the streets of Philly with a clipboard, oh, will you donate to the Temple of Hare Krishna? But just tell them their family wants them back. Their family misses them. No, Hare Krishna is a cult. And it is sad that there are so many religious groups out there that just take away people's autonomy completely and use social pressure and threat of alienation, threat of excommunication in Mrs. Eddy's case, to lock people in. And at least in the case of Christian science, they didn't force people to sell their homes with social pressure, not, not like, quote-unquote, force people, but social obligation to sell their home and give all the money to the church. No, they didn't do that, but it was something where people couldn't get out if they wanted to all the same. And in some way, it's like getting out of a bad relationship. And I'll use another, something else that Twain said to illustrate this. People value what they cannot afford. And in, when he said that, he was talking about how hard it was to get into the church and the amount of money you have to pay for the college and everything like that. But it also speaks to how hard it is to stay in the church, how you're supposed to just keep your mouth shut, leave your brain at home, Twain says, and not speak against Mrs. Eddy or anything the church believes. One final observation that Twain makes, though, and he puts this really close to the end of his book, he says that America is excellent at producing private Christians, but then these private Christians will betray their religion in favor of their political party. And... Hey, that's very true in the modern day. I made videos before about Pennsylvania colonial history and how the Quakers in the colonial government basically abandoned the entire frontier and left them defenseless by refusing, adamantly refusing, to vote for a militia because they were pacifists. They did not believe that violence was right under any circumstance. But at least they stood for something, you know? Like, what do the people in Congress in the modern day stand for? Profit, that is what most of our senators stand for. They will do what their corporate partners want them to in exchange for money and influence. Mark Twain says these people have excellent private morals, but no public ones. They will vote to elect a felon into office, for example. And then a modern-day example, 
President Joe Biden, I don't know how he acted at home back when he still had his mind. I don't know if he was good to his family, if he was a good father, a good husband. He claims to be a Catholic, at least. But then, a recent thing in the short 15-minute news cycle is, I saw something about him giving the sign of the cross at an abortion protest. So, like, giving giving the sign of the cross that Jesus died on at an event that is pro-choice fighting for the rights of mothers to kill their unborn babies. And don't get the wrong impression, I'm not, I'm not an absolutist on abortion, but I'm able to recognize the hypocrisy of you're following a religion that says you're supposed to be an absolutist on abortion, but here you are supporting pro-choice. What's going on? Mark Twain says that Congress is full of Christians who put their party before their religion, he says that Christian science actually has a chance to change that, and he puts out a plea to them to please inject morals back into politics. And that's an interesting thing to think about. I'll leave it there. It seems like a, like a pretty nice thought to leave on. So, I will see you later, and stay classy.